What we're going to do is talk about AI technologies that you can actually use. Yes? Good? Not DNA. We're switching. We're not talking about healthcare anymore. Um, this is actually closer to what I love to do, is to make stuff. Okay, so here we go. We're going to make stuff. First thing we're going to do, we're going to go to QuickDraw. QuickDraw.withgoogle.com. QuickDraw.withgoogle.com. I'm going to show it to you, and then we'll play together, okay? Yes. Talk. This is we can talk together. Withdraw.withgoogle.com. It should look like this. Any questions? Can you guys get to it? Give me a thumbs up or something so I know you got it. All right, great. Okay, so what we're gonna do, we're gonna click the yellow the yellow rectangle. Have you guys done this before? You seen it? Some of you, great. Okay. If you haven't played before, you will not be sad to play again. It's fun. If you like Pictionary. Okay, we're going to draw six pictures and then we're going to wait on the screen together. I'm going to draw a peanut, apparently. You draw your own pictures, okay? Use your sight. Oh, I know. It's peanut. Oh, we got peanut, okay. Oh, I have no clue what you're drawing. Curses. Okay, you should be on this well-drawn screen. You guys get there. Thumbs up for me when you when you have drawn. Thank you. I have two. Three, thumbs up, thank you. Okay, so here we are, we've drawn six pictures, we gave Google some information. We did give Google some information here. What did we give Google? What did we share? We shared our artwork, yeah, our own, our own doodles. How do we draw? And um, I, I drew this one in particular. Could you tell what that is? Tell us a bird. Yeah. Okay. So Google, when they, when it's drawn, when it gathers this data, um, you can click on it and see if you got a word that was wrong, and you can see it thought I was drawing a mouse, maybe a speedboat, or the Great Wall of China. Whoa! It thought my drawings looked more like those things than my bird. There's not a human mind happening here, right? This is a different. A different thing, but I'll show you why it, it didn't recognize that. If you're on this well-drawn screen, there's a word that says data that you can click on right in the middle. So if you can find that data word, it shows you the 50 million drawings that people have given it for free. And you can see all of them. So if you click bat or bathtub or bear, I personally am going to choose butterfly. It's one of my favorites. You can see the hundred, uh, now how, what is it at now? 114,000 butterfly drawings that people have given to Google for free so that they can learn what a butterfly looks like when someone draws it in 20 seconds or less. The important thing here though is, do you see that? When I mouse over one and you can pick something else if you like something else, it's actually showing the way that people draw it. So even though my bird ended up looking looking like a bird that you guys can identify. The pattern of how I drew the bird is not the way that most people draw it. That's why Google couldn't recognize it in the end. Because this data set is not about the final picture. It's about the initial shapes that people use in order to make a drawing. So this butterfly, people are either going to start with a long skinny oval, usually pointed up, you notice know, they almost all point up, and some, you know, oddly shaped B letter uh, and reflection sizes. So you can see that they either start with the long oval or uh, they start with that backward curve thing. And mostly from uh, people who grow up writing English, we draw from the left because that's where we start our letters in the top left corner. So that pattern 
is what makes a butterfly to Google, not the, the final image. You understand the data is actually the way that you draw it. So we, we have given Google all this data and now it knows what human sketches look like. And then, uh, let's go back to the slide. Uh -huh. Not that one, we can close that one. Here we go. This one, we're gonna go to autodraw, autodraw.com. You get to go there too, autodraw.com. This is a product that Google developed from your free data that you gave away to it. That is what happens with AI. We give it data and it learns. So I'm gonna type in autodraw, A-U-T-O, autodraw.com. Okay, here I have a blank piece of paper and the, the tool that I want to use is this black magic pen here and I'm gonna draw a butterfly thinks I'm drawing an ear. And then by the time I get to the two big shapes, I have a list of items at the top. And now I click and I have a clip art maker. Okay, so Google turned this data set into a product. And I can, I can t click on this shape and I can resize it. I can make it bigger. I can change its color. And uh, all of a sudden, I am an artist. I can totally draw. There's a little bit of a problem with this data set, though. And that is, oops, let me give me my magic pen again. As far as I know, this is my sad attempt at a horse. Sorry, horse people. It looks like I've got some dinosaurs up here. Yeah. There's a camel, there's a horse. Okay, so even though I did a really bad drawing, it knew that other people draw equally bad horses, right? Um, but there's no unicorn, which is really interesting to me that there is no unicorn. However, uh, let me get my magic pen back. There is a dragon. Three dragons, in fact. So I think AutoDraw is a really great example of a data set that is perhaps designed or developed more for the male typical presenting gender. There are more options for things that boys like in this database, typically, than girls. And there's no reason for this to be true except that the people who created this program didn't think about unicorns, but they did think about dragons. But auto draw is learning. So there's a hamburger menu on the left and you can see there's some options here. You can read about the program, which is nice how it works, but you can also see the artists. And the nice thing is that you have power and agency to choose let us know and to tell them what you want. So if you are a girl that would like to see more girl products in this program, tell them what you want. Um, if you are an artist and you want to submit your own drawings, you too can participate in the development of AutoDraw. So I like that because it's not a closed system. It's not like you're using some art program that really don't have options. Um, AutoDraw is ready for you to help with it. Okay, anybody draw anything cool with AutoDraw? autodraw.com. Did you guys make anything? Did you draw? Okay, well at least you could see it, I guess. Okay, let's go back up here. Autodraw. Yeah. Pinscreen.com. If you have an Apple phone, this is more fun for you. You can go to the Apple Store and download Pinscreen. Pinscreen, you take a selfie, a single selfie of your face, 
and it makes a 3D avatar play in your games, which is super cool, I think. Uh, but I haven't ended it, so sorry, my friend. Uh, look for the Google logo up there. Here. So pin screen, pinscreen.com. We're going to go over there. Pinscreen.com. This is an avatar made from a single selfie, um, and so you can use these, style them however you want, and you can watch a video of it. Which I think is pretty cool. So this technology, what's one thing that's really cool about it is that UNC Chapel Hill did some of this first work in their computer science department. They were creating avatars, um, and they do full body scans from um, something that's either a, a tablet or a laptop or something very low power, and they capture your full image. So, like, my walk is very different than your walk, right? The way you move our minds, maybe if I had a disability, I would walk is very different. And the technology that you guys have developed in your science department captures all of those things. So, when I play in VR, I'm actually doing So, one problem with big screen, my views are all really skinny. so that when you move into virtual spaces, you have an avatar that's more like it. Ooh. Sorry. So I think it's pretty cool. From anyone. OK, you get the idea? That's Justin Bieber there. You guys use Snapchat. Just curious. So, so filters on your face is an algorithm developed in that world just to be able to identify your face and properly put a filter on it. it was like a huge breakthrough in AI. And so this is just sort of an extension of that. Just being able to transform your face. Alright, got the idea. Let's, uh, let's do something else. Okay, crowdsource.google.com. Crowdsource.google.com. We're going to spend a few minutes here. One thing that AI does really, really well is label images. So if you search, if you do an image search for literally its core, right? You find what? You find the core, and also you can find this cute six year old kid singing about corn. <laughs> hey, sorry, Zoom people. Sorry, Zoom people. I, I forgot. I forgot. I'm sorry, Zoom people. All right, so here we are, crowdsource.google.com. And we are going to think about how all those labels about corn, it's corn. How do we get a six year old into the mix and not just some corn, right? So let's go to crowdsource.google.com. Oh, I feel bad about my, my Zoom friends. Okay, crowdsource.google.com, you'll see. This is a website that Google uses in order to learn how to label images. So we're going to choose image label verification. And I used to use swimming all the time. But guess what? Google got all the information it needed from swimming. So we don't need to do that category anymore. Yeah. What? Hello. Oh, dear. Sorry, Zoom people, like 14 times. Okay. I didn't turn it off. It was not me. Weird. Okay. Image label verification. We are going to choose, oh, let's see. Oh, let's 
go to the assignment. How about, oh, let's do cats. You guys want to do cats? Yeah, cats. Everybody loves cats. Oh, cats are done. That's because everybody loves cats. They should take those off. Let's try another one. Okay, image verification. Okay, let's do chairs. Certainly no one did chair. Is this a chair? That, my friends, is a hot dog. So I'm gonna choose no. You can play on your own. You're gonna get different images. You can you don't have to use mine. Okay, it, does this image contain a chair? Is that a chair or a couch? Oh, so but I have to say yes or no. Are we already struggling to define whether or not this image has a chair in it? <laughs> okay. We can't even decide if that thing in the background is a chair, friends. So this is why uh, computers, sometimes we get really mad at the results, but we actually have these same conversations. I'm gonna say no, I agree with you. This is not a chair. Is this a chair? is, I think that's a church. Church, not a chair. Are we going to say no? Okay. Uh, this is a hobbit hole. But does it contain a chair? A bench. It's a bench and not a chair. Okay, good. Um, does this contain a chair? That is a that's a table, thank you. Yes, that is a table. Um, does this image contain a chair? Yes, why, do, why is it a chair? She's a sitting on it, but what makes it a chair? She's sitting. It's for one person that contains a chair. Okay, this appears to be a television and an entertainment center. I see no chair, do we agree? So we are teaching Google about the differences in some of these images. Okay, so now these people are sitting. Is there a chair? No, so sitting isn't a chair. We are teaching the Google very specifically what a chair is just by giving images. So if people are sitting, but there's no other thing, there's no chair, right? If the thing is for sitting, but it's too long, it's not a chair. The thing can be made of wood. The thing can be made of fabric. Oh, what's this? Another kind of chair made of plastic. Is it a chair? Yeah, very iconic chair, right? Everybody has this $9 version in their backyard, their grandma's backyard. Yes, that is a chair. Yeah. Yeah, this is, so this is very specific. Does it contain a chair? So in this case, it's trying to figure out if there's any sort of chair in the image. With swimming, swimming used to be one of the ones that I did, and the first picture that would come up would be a fish. Is the fish swimming? And some people would say yes, and some people would say no. And then we'd get to water polo which is a sport with a ball and you throw it, it's like soccer sort of, but in the water. And polo involves swimming, but were they swimming? Not necessarily, right? Throwing, defending. And so some of those nuances is what the data is learning. What happens if we all go in and just click yes for every photo? Yeah, Google gets stupider, right? Yeah. For sure. So um, this type of information where we give labels is really helpful, but it can be used nefariously. Do you guys think it's fun? You are actually participating in helping the Google image recognition software get better when you use crowdsource. How are we doing on time? Pretty good. Okay, let's make, let's make some more stuff. You can always go back and play with crowdsource. Okay, W3 schools. You guys have learned a lot about technology today and um, you haven't necessarily learned how to make that technology. This is one of the best websites as a resource for online learning about computer science very broadly. 
Um, but so I want to show you a few things about it, so that if you want to make, be more of a maker, um, you can be. So they, this is a place where there's a ton, a ton, a ton of references of how to code, how to learn any type of code. Um, but they specifically have a section right here under tutorials, learn AI, learn machine learning, learn data science. It assumes at the start that you know nothing. You don't need to know a single thing to start here. Um, as, a, as a former developer, 10 years, I worked in computer science in building databases and, and web development, uh, primarily business to business systems, the back end side of things. And although I started out with some college knowledge, what was way more important was that actually that I built my own stuff. And so if you are like figuring out whether or not you can afford college, if you have a strong portfolio and you teach yourself stuff and you are good, you can find that entry level job for real. So you can teach yourself, and I want to make sure you know that this is a place to do it. The important thing is that you build things that work so that you have a portfolio to display. And so in their Learn AI section, I just want you to know they have the first example, oh, image classification. So this is not the Google version that we just did. This is the code. This is how it works. This is the math that you've learned and wondered what it was for, for. This is what it's for. And so you can go through and learn all about how to create these various things. Right here on W3 Schools, it's completely free. Questions? Anybody actually going to try this? Check it out? Yes, good, OK. Um, one of my favorite things here, too, is just like if you just want to mess around with a website, you can. There's really good stuff in here. Just you know, There's guides and forms all kinds of things. And one of the things I use all the time is that there's this HTML colors, and you can actually see like what all the colors are named and how they're picked, and all the different types of names. And like, so if you have your very favorite color, I have a friend who's really into pink, and all of her stuff is like branded pink. And so she has her favorite hex code color. Um, and so this is just a great place as a reference if you're working on other things and you need some specific information. They have all these great tutorials. You don't even have to sign in. You can just use it. OK, write it down, W3 schools. Remember, if you forget, it's www, right? How many, three, how many Ws? There's three of them. W3. And then you learn. If you want to be a coder, if you are interested in computer science in particular, you will have to learn forever. It never stops. You'll always have to be learning. Um, the stuff that I coded doesn't even exist anymore. The, the, the languages that I use, they aren't around. So um, you'll always be learning. OK, Vocaloid. Has anybody seen a Vocaloid? Do you watch them? You, have, you know a yes, a little bit? Some of you know what I'm talking about. These are like anime characters that sing and dance, and you can go see them for real on a stage. Please tell me you know what I'm talking about. Yes? No. OK. I do feel like we should at least maybe visit the YouTube and um, see a Vocaloid performance so that you know that I'm not crazy. V O C A. Oh, there it is, Vocaloid Los Angeles. Hatsune Miku, anybody? Anime fans? This is a real concert. There's 70,000 people here. You can see them. Oops. Any real musicians? And the performer is an anime character. Anybody in band? Band kids here? Few, OK. So musically, there's a revolution happening. We're never going to get rid of real live in-person performance. But singers and musicians are moving to the digital space. And some of our biggest, this is a very popular character around the world, particularly in Japan. Uh, some of our biggest characters are not people. Okay, 
So, if you want to be a person making art and music from, uh, from people that aren't real, Vocaloid.com is where we're going. Um, Vocaloid. This is a, a singing synthesizer. If you really are into music, digital music, if you uh, you know want to create music without singing it yourself, you should download this software to a real computer. It's really how it works best. But I at least want to show you there is a free trial version right here in the corner. You can get it right there. And we can preview some of these songs right here on the main page. Now these are AI singers. They are not real people. They make music. I don't know if the, my people far away can hear them. Okay. And what's interesting about them is that they are not just singing, that, but you can adjust every bit of what they sing. And by that I mean, we'll watch this a second. The way the software works, you're just a person at home in your home studio. So that line is the graph of the singer, but it's not a real person. So just like in any other software program, you can grab the line and move it and change what they sing. So you can see he's changing the words. He's typing in the words and then he's moving the pitch. So you get the idea. In, when you use Vocaloid, you can start with a voice that isn't your own or a completely digital voice. You can use your own voice and modify it. You can change what is said, how it's said, the pitch, the timbre, all the good things there. And if you want to play with this, download free right there. Cool, right? You can manipulate accents, vibrato, rhythmic feel, and change your own vocal production. There's another program like this. It's called Descript. I find it fascinating. We can't do as much with it. Um, but if you're a podcaster or video editor, this to me is the coolest, coolest thing. So what happens is I go in, I make a voice print of myself. That means I read a script so that this AI knows what my voice sounds like. And then I can, there's, there it is, you can see. She talked, it recorded into like a Google Doc type thing. And now someone else that isn't me can go in and edit what I said in the text version and it updates my video. So I could um, record um, something okay where I say a bunch of um, pauses and things. And then I can hand that off to my friend right here and um, they can um, edit out all of that so that I can have a completely clean podcast or video. And if I've done a complete voice print, you could even take my voice and write a script for me and I could say it without ever having said anything out loud. Say that. Yeah, yeah, right? You'd have to trust somebody with your voice print. Totally, totally. You have to be careful with that. Okay, you can generate singing voices. How about AIartists.org? AIartists.org, this has over 40 tools. If you are into AI or if you're into art and you're not sure about AI, this is a fun place to play. AI artists, I-S-T-S has the S on the end, dot org. I spelled it wrong, didn't I? A-R-T-I-S-T, -T, there. 
AIartists.org, largest community of artists using our AI. There's a little bit of a debate right now about who owns AI art. If you're not the creator of the original art and you modify it using an algorithm, is it the original artist who contributed? Is it the person who created the algorithm? Or is it you who came up with the unique genius of merging various things? Um, I think what will end up happening is we'll end up with some sort of policy like, you know how like a lot of cool hip hop music is resampled and remixed? We're probably gonna end up with some sort of like visual legislation that gives credit to all of the contributors and financial credit too. Um, that, those systems aren't yet in place though. And so if you're a person taking like paintings from the 16th century and, and having an algorithm you know, merge them with future scapes. Um, there's not really any way to tell how who should be compensated and who gets credit for that. So this um, this community AIartists.org. If you scroll down, you can see like cool, really nice art and pe what people are doing and some history of it. And then also there are resources, which are creative AI tools and generative art guide. But this creative AI tools is the cool place to be. So we go to create, look, 41 tools, 41 tools. So lots and lots of AI that you can make and they're uh, by section. So music, uh, art would be like visual art. There's also movement and dance, sketches with Bill Jones, really cool stuff. PoseNet is much like a Kinect, if you've ever seen a Microsoft Kinect, where your body turns into like points and you can interact in an in a important way. But we're gonna try Deep Dream Generator right here under AI Generated Pictures. Um, there's also some neat GANs over here, but we're gonna try Deep Dream to, to start. We use a lot of the Google ones because they're really accessible. A lot of the other ones require sign-in. So Deep Dream Generator is a human AI collaboration and there is a text to dream tool and you can just try it, get started. Oh, don't put up a wall for me. Well, you used to be able to do it without signing in. Can I please text to dream? You can see these are artworks that it has made. It's collaborated. You didn't used to have to sign in. Yeah, free, you need to sign up. Okay, well, let's try ASDF. Do we have to make a password? Let's see. Oh, curses. Okay. If you feel like signing in, you can. You have a Google account. If you don't, you can watch here. Okay, so way that, the way this works is that we're gonna generate an image at the top. And what you do is write what you want it to create. So I can use some words. Give me some words, something cool, something you'd like. Favorite sport? Any of you play a sport? Basketball, all right. Now tell me your favorite animal. Horse, okay, we're gonna do horse basketball. Oh, we could have unicorn basketball. Can we do unicorn basketball? That's a cool idea. Unicorn basketball. Okay, we want normal quality. We, we don't necessarily need to enhance anything. Let's generate it. Unicorn basketball. Now, this has never been created before. We could have a really long sentence here. We could also specify some of these generators. You can be really specific. You can say like photorealistic or um, Salvador Dali. And if you, you can imagine something very different from 4K photorealistic versus like a melting image of Salvador Dali. It is actually creating a image here um, that that it, if I did this again, I might get a different result. Okay, what do we get? We got unicorn basketball. It did it, right? Yeah. Yeah, stable diffusion. Yeah, yeah, all right. Did you do it right now? 
Very good. Um, any Discord users here? Unsurprising, yes. I realize my fellow adults have not always followed you onto Discord, but I have. So I want to make sure that you know also like the best. Yeah, you've done it? Yeah. I know, and so it was on beta for a while and it was totally free. So Midjourney is on Discord and it's an AI generator. Um, there is a cheat sheet that I think is worth downloading. This is, um, I gotta give credit, Midjourney is an AI uh, generator like Deep Dream, but better, super good. And this is a cheat sheet that was developed. It's on at firebasestorage.googleapis.com. Um, and it has all, like you could take a screenshot of this or something. These are the main commands on Discord to generate art with, with, uh, within Discord. So imagine creates the image, blah, 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 help, help, info, et cetera. Um, but I think Midjourney is one of my favorite uh, AI generators right now. Um, you can also play online with Dolly and Dolly 2, um, really powerful image generators um, that are sort of blending um, what's real and what's not real. Okay, how are we doing? Pretty good, okay. Okay, let's talk about GPT-3 and GPT-4. Do you know about them? Anybody heard of them? Yes, okay. Are your teachers afraid yet? Yeah? Do you think that teachers should be afraid of this technology? Yeah, okay, so GPT-3 and GPT-4 have huge amounts of data on how people write. And for small local newspapers who wanna publish sports scores, um, those are probably already being written by AIs because a baseball game, there's been so many years of baseball games and they're all the same. It's like what happened in the top of the ninth and who got a hit and what's his RBIs. And the AIs can just write the whole game now. You don't even have to send a journalist. And so at Stanford, there's a major called computational journalism and it's uh, like they've almost given up on traditional journalism, although there's a huge need and importance in journalism. But computational journalism is like, you know, there's actually a story in the data. We can mine like Twitter feeds to see how people are feeling with semantic analysis. And we can write some stories using GPT-3 and GPT-4. And um, so this, this is a, uh, an example of how, to, how text generators work. But GPT-4 is so powerful, it can write like where if I was an English teacher, I might be worried that my students won't write their papers anymore. No. Right. It's not plagiarism. Well, it is plagiarism. You didn't write it, um, but it it, it isn't, doesn't always give the same results because it's generating it each time. So let's let's write a paper. Uh, I need a subject. Tell me something funny you did in the last week. Something funny. Do you have a small sibling? They did something crazy. No. Yes. What? Okay, so we're gonna start with Harry Potter. Harry Potter, and we're gonna take that little fragment, spilt his cereal. Spil I guess he spilled his cereal. Harry Potter spilled his cereal, and then what did Voldemort do? Maybe, let's be more interesting. Where's my, you were a basketball player, right? Basketball, basketball, basketball? Okay, tell me something that happened on the basketball court that Voldemort might have done. Okay, Voldemort scored a three-pointer. Let's try it. Yeah. 
and let's ask the AI to write us a story about these things. Harry Potter spilled his cereal. Voldemort scored a three-pointer. Ron stared into Harry's eye. He reached for his wand and started to put it on his head. Harry let out a wail and yelled at the door in his ears. Voldemort pushed and Harry pulled up. Harry screamed. He started to run, but Harry caught him. He started running and Harry got to his feet and grabbed the floor, pushing him back. So anyway, you see, it knows who we're talking about. It's written something somewhat nonsensical. But the better algorithms, if we had picked something that is more academic, it would get closer and closer to what a human would write. So these are fun to play with, um, especially if you take a prompt like, astrophysicists have discovered, what have they discovered? that dark matter like the sun is extremely close to our solar system in mass and that its red light is just as large as our sun. If I don't know anything about this subject, I might actually believe it. Right? It's kind of fun. What? Yes, yes. It, it doesn't only have to write like in standard English. It can write in a dialect or in another language. Um, it depends where you are, though, whether or not like, there's enough data. I'll give you a really good example. We did crowdsource, right, like crowdsource.google.com. And if I put in wedding, I am probably going to get white dresses and tuxedos and like matching people uh, at a Christian altar. I'm probably going to get something that is close to an American wedding. What I am not going to get is a, is a wedding that would be appropriate in Zambia, right? And that would look very different, or India, where there might be a sari involved and like really bright colors, because the cultural context of the search is in America. Now, if I went to Google in India, I would probably get the right results for India. Um, but, that, but that's a great point, is like, if there's not enough data, then we might not get as good results. So it probably writes better in English or Mandarin, Chinese, than it would in a smaller dialect where there's less data available. How are we doing? Oh, we're pretty good, okay. The last thing is that it's really important to make stuff. There's a guy, his name is Douglas Rushkoff. I really recommend his books. He, um, he wrote this title up here, it says Program or Be Programmed, and he wrote it like 25 years ago. And he said, if you're not the makers, then you're the product. So all this stuff you learned about today was about data. Like you're giving away your data all the time. It's almost impossible not to. Um, not impossible, really, really challenging. So the way to, to avoid some of the worst consequences is to be a creator of some of the solutions. It doesn't mean you have to code, but it means that whatever you are, whether it's a journalist or a school teacher, that you're aware of the ethics of these technologies and that you do something about it. Okay, questions for me. We've got 10 minutes. Do we have any way to, to have the Zoom people ask me questions too? Because I'd love to hear from them too. Do you guys have questions for me? Yeah. So you're talking about upscaling images? Yeah, so um, the, do you want to know about the math of that a little bit? You know? Okay. Yeah, so that's really cool technology that didn't used to exist. Um, another interesting place where AI, we don't even think about it, but it's totally AI, is like autofocus. And the way your phone knows what to focus on and, and like some of the cool technologies like Night Sight and stuff, those are all AI technologies. Um, the photo space is, is like really, really good right now for AI. Totally. Questions? What can we make? Uh, there and then there. Okay, go ahead. Do you mean like when I visited the doctor? Yeah, when I visited the doctor, they had uh, recorded my son's visit and they were testing to see if that technology would work for transcription. So when you visit the doctor's office, 
they write down what happened in that visit. They say something like, um, this patient has presented with a fracture of the tibia and we recommend six weeks of uh, cast and then you know two weeks of physical therapy, something like that, where they're, they're saying what happened and diagnosis. They might also share different information like the patient presented with their mother, they appeared to be well taken care of. There might be some more like s some information that's not, mm, it's not just about your physicality, but like your circumstances. Are you in a safe place where you're likely to get better? That kind of thing. Or what additional support you might need. Like they need help with Medicare in order to pay for this treatment. That might be in there too. But the idea is that that becomes a part of your medical record. So one of my questions from that recording was, that it was recording while I wasn't in the room. So previously, the doctor would leave the room and then type up their notes or, or dictate into a, a microphone and that would be typed up by essentially like a secretary, a medical transcriptionist is the word. And um, that, then that would become part of your medical record. But if it's a recording that happens from an AI uh, that translates speech to text, that's the AI piece, um, could the conversation that I have privately about my treatment go into that record. And it's probably not a big deal if it's about a broken arm, but it might be a very big deal if we were deciding on what cancer treatment to get or something like that, and whether or not we wanted to continue treatment, or um, whether or not we wanted to go see a different doctor for a second opinion. Is that being recorded? Is it part of my medical record now, even if the doctor wasn't in the room? I don't know. I think the part that bothers me is that I don't know. Questions? Yeah, oh, wait, you and then you, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the comment is about podcast.ai, which is a website. Uh, I did not play it here because there's some swear words in it. Oh. But it's um, completely AI generated as a podcast, and there's enough vocal print of Joe Rogan that it's pretty accurate. The w only way that I could tell that it was really uh, fake was that it, it mispronounced um, common famous people's names. Like, I think, was it like Bruce Willis or one of the names was wrong that they had said. And, and you're like, oh, no, well, nobody who's a personality would get that one wrong. Steve Jobs was on the air, even though he's passed away. Um, so that's the interview. So podcast.ai, um, language warning. Here and then there, yeah. So my job is chief operating officer. So that means most of the time I run a company. And um, sometimes I get to come and hang out with you guys, which is like the best, the best. High schoolers are the best. Um, totally, you are. Why, why do you say no? No, like you guys are actually like super interesting and smart. And I wish I could talk more to each of you because I always learn from you. Like anybody played Detroit Become Human? That's an AI. You played it? Yeah. That's an AI game uh, where you get to play as the AI. Um, and I learned that from you guys. And then I went and played it. So if there's any media that I'm missing, I want to know about it from you guys, too. You could email me, text me. So my day-to-day -day is to um, help kids learn about AI. That's, my, that's the job of my company. It's not always my job. Um, but I was a, te a teacher previous, previously. Yeah. Text generation it says who it's written by. Very good. It is pla it's totally plagiarism. Yes, if you use an AI to write your paper, you didn't write your paper. Just to be clear. You, yeah, if you wrote the topic sentence, you did not write the paper. Um, I think there's a college professor. I, I work with the National Humanities Center, so I work with 15 different colleges who are developing ethics classes with AI. And that's one of the cool things I get to do in my job. And um, one of the professors in that program is writing, a, is doing a class where you start your topic with an AI and then you write your paper as compared to what the AI wrote. I think that's a really great way for teachers to incorporate uh, AI into their language classes is to start with the algorithm. Because what's really exciting in the end is what you think. Yeah. 
Yeah, thank you. Was it, it's called I Am Woman. I Am Woman is the recommendation. That reminds me, there's a book called Clara and the Sun, Clara with a K, and Clara and the Sun is a Pulitzer, it won some sort of major book award, but it's about um, when, it's a futuristic novel, when um, children have robot friends as companions um, as they're growing up. That's really good. And then uh, Ray Bradbury has a short story of um, an electric mother from the 60s, which is equally interesting about what if you could have the perfect mother. Um, looks like people are coming back. Thank you for spending time with me in this breakout session and having a chat. Thank you virtual people as well. And